Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Behold Podcast on the Genre Equality channel. I'm Hitzir. I'm Isa. And this week, we're going to be discussing meta films that examine <laughs> the perils between, you know, of blurring fiction and reality for the sake of art. You know, we'll be discussing the recursive meta writing of Charlie Kaufman's adaptation, yep. the, the sort of emotional exploitation of the, ac- of the acting process in Madeline's Madeline, the deconstruction of ego uh, in Birdman, and <laughs> finally, the dissociative identity disorder that comes with being a celebrity yep. in Perfect Blue. Um, all these movies explore the rewards and costs of wrapping or warping real lives within uh, artificial perception and imagination. Um, it's a very interesting topic to discuss. Um, what were your thoughts on it? You know, just it, just in general at first. Uh, I I feel like rewatching um like these couple of films for us to talk about has been 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 quite a trip, right? Like uh, obviously Birdman adaptation. I watched it a couple of times. Just mm. kind of needed a refresh. Madeline Madeline uh, Madeline's Madeline is uh new to me uh, and it was yep. uh, it was quite a trip and of course perfect blue is a, a classic uh, anime staple for a lot of people mm. um but just revisiting these films have been um a, b- a bit of a mental bender i think like there are moments yeah. in time where as an audience i feel and to varying degrees over the four films um you feel kind of lost right within mm-hmm. that whole scale and to have all of that kind of stacked up in a short period of time is a bit of a challenge Mm-hmm. Um, for sure, but I mean, like you always kind of walk away like questioning a fair number of things, right? Whether it be, you know, um, what is your identity as an audience, right? Like how uh, culpable you are in certain cases, or how um, immersed are you really, right? When you're kind of like watching from this outsider perspective, and of course mm. that kind of bleeds into daily life as well. Yeah. Um. So I mean, like I think this particular episode is going to be pretty interesting for us to talk about because um there have been so many good films within this theme. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the four of which that we've decided to talk about today uh are some of the standout ones, lah, for sure. Definitely, man. Let's begin uh with the king of this theme, <laughs> um Charlie Kaufman, who it can be argued. With the possible exception of Eternal Sunshine, which we've already discussed, yep. every single one of his films touch upon this theme to varying degrees. Yes. Uh, you know, being John Malkovich, being, you know, a puppeteer. Um, adaptation, though, is <laughs> most, most about this theme. Yeah. Because it stars, I mean, the main character is Charlie Kaufman himself. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not aware of what adaptation is about, it is Charlie Kaufman's second film. Uh, and it is based on his struggles, the real Charlie Kaufman in, in real life. He's based on his struggles to adapt um, a, a book called The Orchid Thief, a 1998 nonfiction book uh, by Suzanne Orleans. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's suffering from writer's block. Uh, and it involves elements that are adapted to the, to the book, plus fictitious elements, including, you know, Kaufman's twin brother, yep. um, also credited as a writer for the film, although he doesn't exist, uh, <laughs> both played by Nicolas Cage, and a romance between Orlean and, and LaRoche, you know, and, and it, it culminates in completely uh, invented events, of course, um, and it includes versions of Orlean and LaRoche three years after the events of The Orchid Thief. So, mm. this is a movie about Charlie Kaufman trying to adapt a book called The Orchid Thief. <laughs> in real life, he 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 didn't know how to do it. It was a difficult book to adapt. Yeah. He didn't he just had no idea how to do it. So he decided to write a film about himself trying to adapt the book. Um hence the the, the title adaptation. Um it's an incredible film. Once again, you know, directed by frequent collaborator uh Spike Jones. As I mentioned, it stars Nicolas Cage, uh, as as uh, Charlie Kaufman and his brother Donald. It has Meryl Streep as Susan Orlean, mm-hmm. you know, who is the the author of The Orchid Thief. Chris Cooper as John LaRoche, Kara Seymour, Brian Cox, Tilda Swinton, Maggie Gyllenhaal in supporting roles. Lots of good stars in here. Lots of very clever writing. Um, almost too clever for its own good. <laughs> yeah. Um, man. Um, when when was the first time you saw adaptation? Uh, did it blow your mind? And, and and in the 20 years since, you know, has your opinion changed of, of, of its genius? Um, when did I first see Adaptation? Let me think. I, I think yeah. it was um, my Kaufman binge after watching uh, Eternal Sunshine. Mm. Right? So immediately after that, after the few times that I rewatched Eternal Sunshine, I'm just like, okay, let's who, who's who's responsible for this? 
Uh, and of course, it started with um, uh, being John Malkovich, right? Uh, yeah. With all of that. And then it eventually got into adaptation. Um, I think at that point in time, thoughts that kind of struck me were just like, what what in the world is, is going on, right? Like going into it without really understanding the background of, of what, um, or, or what was supposed to happen and what was supposed to be going on. It was a little confusing mm-hmm. uh, the first time I watched it. Uh, however, revisiting it this uh, recently over the last couple of weeks, um, yeah. it's it, it it takes a very different thing. Like, like we've got a few more Kaufman films that have come out. Uh, most recently was um, I'm thinking of anything. I'm thinking of ending things. Yeah, yeah. which was um, snubbed out at the Oscars. By the way, I am not saying it should have been nominated <laughs> for Best Picture, but Jesse Buckley, who is starring in it, should have been nominated for Best Actress. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Right. So, like, um. In context, right, of, of my most recent viewing of this, like it's been fairly interesting, uh, given the fact that Nicolas Cage is now who he is, right? Mm. Like, Nick Cage is now who he, who has he has become and who has evolved into, as opposed to, like, what his performance was like, kind of uh, back then in, in 2002. Mm. Um, you know, and then, of course, seeing, like, some really, really big stars um, that we would consider today. Yep. Um, in the film as well. So, like, all in all, I mean, like, great performances all around. I mean, yeah. I think this was kind of, like, peak Cage for me, like, that particular era of the stuff that he was doing, which was, like, quirky and interesting, but at the same mm. time, like, we're all around great performances. We hadn't quite, like, delved into um, mm-hmm. the strangeness that that is his uh, portfolio at the moment. Yep. Um, you know, uh, and it's a lot clearer now and I think it's a little easier to digest in comparison to all the other stuff Kaufman has done since then. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I I, I do agree with that, you know. There is, um, as I mentioned, this is recursive writing. If you're not familiar, there's a concept in mathematics uh, called recursion, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel, I feel like Kaufman and Spike Jones have apparently discovered the cinematic equivalent of it with adaptation. Yeah. You know, it is occasionally mag- maddening, but frequently brilliant. And and it kind of varies between, you know, sometimes it's a bit self-indulgent, <laughs> um, as, as a lot of Kaufman films are. And, and most of the time, it's insightfully sharp, despite being self-indulgent, you know. Mm-hmm. So you might not appreciate it, but regardless of whether you appreciate the, the layers of the film, it is likely to stick with you as one of the most original works you've ever seen, you know? Yep. The first hour of watching Adaptation, the first time, first hour of viewing, I was still wondering... I knew I knew what I was watching. Like, yep. I understood it. I was wondering whether I liked it or not, you know? Uh, um, okay. and, and, and it's come to be my favourite um, Charlie Kaufman work, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic piece of writing. And, and I think it leaves you breathless with curiosity. You know, you're curious about how this came to be. Uh, and it teases itself with the directions it might take, you know. Yeah. Um, especially as, as at that time, me, I was an aspiring writer, you know. Um, how do you write like this? How do you write about writing like this? Uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> Nicholas Cage's um, probably most immersive performance I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to watch the film is to be actively involved in the challenge of its of its creation, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, um, and, and it's rightfully been named as, as one of the best films of the of the of the twin uh, of the two thousands of the knots. Uh, you know, I think screenwriting this smart, this inventive, this passionate, you know, and and this funny is is very rare in Hollywood, mm-hmm. um, especially in the early two thousands. You know, where films like fucking like Crash were uh, were winning Best Picture Oscars. You know, yeah. Here comes something so fresh, um, so new, uh, and so outrageous. Uh, that you just have to stop and, and, and think about, you know, um, how does Charlie Kaufman's brain work, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of the most boldly uh, sincere and clever uh, films that I, I've ever seen. And it also, you know, it's very self-critical of itself mm-hmm. uh, and self-critical of Charlie Kaufman's own process. That is the theme of the film. Yeah. Uh, and, and the way that it veers into its many directions is bonkers and bananas. And I feel like, you know, um, like like a different Charlie, like like Charlie Day, and you know it's always sunny. You know, the meme with the board and the many <laughs> strings and all of that. You know this is where you go there. Yeah, that, that's how I that's how I felt watching the film. Yeah, oh, most definitely, most definitely. Uh, at which point in time, if if you recall, right, yeah. did you start to realize that the movie was kind of folding in on itself? Um, 
probably my first watch towards the end. Mm. Um, at that time, I I wasn't following you know screenwriters or whatever. I didn't know who Charlie Kaufman was. This yeah. is just another film to me. I had seen being John Malkovich at the time, but I, you know they it didn't quite connect to me lah until until I read up more about it lah. Yeah. Um. So I I I grasped it on my first viewing, but I didn't fully understand it until my second viewing. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like it's it's a little difficult. Like I don't have uh, adaptation has always stood out as like a fascinating film, right? Mm-hmm. From the time that I first watched it, but it's only like reviewing it now that mm-hmm. it has it's become a, a lot more special for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, just the like little little things that you kind of miss out. Uh, I think on first viewing, we're just trying to keep up with what's going on. Right, like it's a peek into into Kaufman played by Nicolas Cage's head while being, um, you know, a peek into his uh, Kaufman's actual head, uh, mm-hmm. and with all of those things kind of going on, like sometimes there are these little quips or these little kind of like asides that you don't necessarily pay attention to, that are mm-hmm. extremely clever and start, you know, kind of foreshadowing how the origami of the the script is going to to fall into itself or to unfold into itself as it turns out mm-hmm. um and yeah so it's been a it's been kind of a ride like um I'm revisiting this for sure and i think like um with everything that he's done right the whole slew of things that of work that he's done like revisiting adaptation now mm-hmm. um has actually changed my mind like i i used to think that adaptation was fairly difficult to to kind of like understand and to get into Mm-hmm. Um, but in comparison to everything else, I mean, obviously, Eternal Sunshine is the the kind of like entry gateway, right? Mm. Um, um, to his work, but adaptation is definitely one of the mm. the easy ways, the enjoyable yeah. ways, rather. Um, to to kind of like enjoy Kaufman's strange, strange mind in his strange, strange worlds. I would argue that Eternal Sunshine, and I've already argued this like in our Eternal Sunshine episode, that Eternal Sunshine is a bit of an anomaly in his uh, filmography. Um, yep. it is, weirdly enough, Eternal Sunshine is his most standard film, but also the most different film because it's just not very him. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very linear... I mean, I know the, the structure is non-linear, but it's, it, it's easy <laughs> to understand, you know? Yeah. But like adaptation has been expounded upon in films like Sinodaki New York, um, and Melissa, I'm thinking of ending things. Yeah. Um, uh, a, a variety of his of his films have gone deeper into his theme, but and I think that this is the most, uh, the, the easiest gateway into that theme. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah the, I think it's, it's even easier than being John Mal- Malkovich because it it goes direct. You know, it's an Occam's razor into his brain. You know, mm. it, it's kind of a filmmaking miracle in a way. It's okay. Not number one, right? Um, <laughs> it's a it's a movie about a, It's the story of a movie being made. Yeah. Um. Which is not unusual. We we've seen movies like that, like you know, like Mank or The Disaster Artist, or you know, there there are a bunch of films about movies being made. It's not that unusual. Yeah. So so that's a. But b, it's also the story of the book that he's adapting, uh, combined with the with with him trying to adapt the film. It's yeah. a story of orchid thievery and and criminal conspiracies. And and c, it is the deceptive combination of fiction and real life by encompassing all of that, all of the above. You know. Um. <laughs> Only Spike Jones uh, could have done this with with Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. Uh, it's like like I said, it, it it's a miracle, and, and and during all of its like you know dazzling twists and turns, I think the movie remains consistently engaging, uh, and fascinating because there there is there is a worry right with self indulgent films such as mm. such as this that you could lose the audience, you know, like you know you you strip away the entertainment factor, and he's writing for himself. Yeah, it, it it it's not. It's consistently en- engaging and fascinating, uh, and, and not just because of the direction and, and and the writing, but because of the the lighthearted darkness of the performances. You know, I think like Nicholas Cage has already gotten like a bunch of praise for this, so I don't need to <laughs> keep on to it. You know, um, Chris Cooper has one of his more forgotten performances. He plays a con man of extraordinary intelligence who is a uh, who is attractive to a sophisticated New Yorker because he is so intensely himself in a mm. world where very few people are, you know. Uh, and and Nicholas Cage as as the, as the twins, he gets so to deeply he gets so deeply inside the opposite characters yeah. that we can always tell them apart even though he uses no tricks of hair or makeup. Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. And, and 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 his narration creates desperately the agony of a man who is so smart 
he understands his problems intimately, yeah. and yet so neurotic, he is <laughs> captive to them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and Meryl Streep is Meryl Streep, what, what, what are you going to say, right? Yeah, Meryl Streep is exactly. the queen, right, okay. yeah. I, 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 I especially love the inclusion of Dono, right? Like, yeah. it is such a inventive way of examining Kaufman himself, yeah. Um, as as kind of like the other right, like within that whole thing, and like he provides a lot of the comic relief. That's one right, but mm-hmm. at the at the same time, while um Charlie uh is 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 worrying about like, how he's gonna adapt all this, like Donald's relative success to yeah. that in his uh in his <laughs> in his own script, um is is a welcome break from the neuroticism right that we occasionally get swept up in when 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 Kaufman is in one of his moods, mm-hmm. um. And like it's such a, a a well you know um paced way to go about doing that like you never kind of like get annoyed to the point or get lost in in the that neuroticism, um, and in in the way that Donald breaks Charlie's neuroticism, he also breaks out the audience out of that as well, which al- allows us to kind of take a step back and realize okay like it's not just you know us being like sucked into this one particular writer's head and his narrative in his head, but there's mm-hmm. this greater thing that's going on outside of that. Yeah, um, one of the most interesting things about film isn't necessarily the film itself. For mm. me, personally, if I was a writer, if I was Susan Orlean, right, I optioned the book, I sold it to a studio who then gave it to Charlie Kaufman. What would I feel about Charlie Kaufman doing this to my work? How, what does Susan, Susan Orlean feel about, uh, about adaptation? So, I went to read up on it, and, and this is what, <laughs> yeah. and this, this is what Susie, Susan Orlean said. I, I admittedly have not read the Arcative, so, so I don't know how good or bad it is. Like, that's not for me to judge. Yeah. But, I think an author has a right to an opinion on how their work is adapted, right or wrong. You For know? sure, yeah. So, so Susan Orlean, at first, um, strongly opposed to making the film. Like, and, and, <laughs> and she ended up reluctantly approving its production. Uh, but at the end, ultimately was very impressed with the final results. Um, in 2012, in an interview, she said that while reading the screenplay, she was in complete shock. Her first reaction was, absolutely not. They had to get my permission and I just said, no, are you kidding? This is going to ruin my career. Um, and very wisely, the, the studio didn't pressure her. So they told, they told her that everybody else had agreed and somehow she got emboldened. Uh, and then she said it was certainly scary to see the movie for the first time. Yep. It took a while for me to get over the idea that I had been like insane enough to agree to it. But in the end, uh, she said, uh, I love the movie now, finally, you know, once, once she got, got over it. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Susan Orlean called Meryl Streep's portrayal of her one of her favorite performances by far uh, of Meryl Streep's career. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, she also admits that obviously biased because, uh, you know, she was playing her. <laughs> and, and she appreciates that her version of the character was not based on herself, not based on the real Orlean, yeah. but on how Streep imagined Orlean is based on reading The Orchid Thief, you know. Yeah. So d- despite the film's fictional parts, you know, Orlean kind of praised the, the, the fidelity to the book spirit. Like what she said, uh, and I quote, what I admire the most is that it's very true to the book's themes of life and obsession. Um, and there are also insights into things which are much more subtle in the book about longing and about disappointment. So although it is not really about the Orchid Thief, it captures the spirit of the Orchid Thief. And uh, what a way to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, <clears throat> I, think, I think this time around, um, the line where he goes like, oh, Donald tells him like, just, then just make some shit up, right? Yep. Um, you know, and that's kind of the turning point for like the action sequence within the movie um, itself. Uh, it, it's in completely fascinating to to imagine how closely the process mm-hmm. of writing adaptation was for Kaufman to the actual um, film itself. You know, mm-hmm. like just, I, I, I'm, I'm really, really curious. Like he, he, hasn't been that forward necessarily. I mean, like he said, like, oh yeah, you know, it, all, all the emotions are kind of captured there, but I really wonder how um, how much of that is actually reflected within the film itself. I, I Yeah, I agree. And, and a lot of the film is Kaufman criticizing himself and his own process and his own writer's block. Yeah. Um, he writes about himself attending a screenwriting masterclass where he is coded <laughs> by the teacher. <laughs> Uh, for, you know, uh, things like uh, conflict and car chases and gunplay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it is Kaufman repudiating that, that, that formulaic trope of, adapt- of adapting uh, a, a rather dry book la, by, by injecting um, 
inorganic action sequences in it, right? Yeah. Uh, and he gets to have his cake and eat it too because <laughs> the the final climax of the film, as as Isa described, is exactly what he was quoting himself about. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I didn't actually um recognize that until my second viewing, like a, a year after I first uh, saw this in cinemas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like the. You know when when does it become? Uh, I mean, when is it still fiction? When is still like autobiographical? And like at, in the at the end of the day, right? Like an adaptation of the Alkitab was made. You know, just not in the way that any one of us could possibly expect reading this mm-hmm. on paper before watching it. Um, yeah. You know, so like we could go on and on about like all these like kind of different layers and stuff like that. But I think like as we're recommending adaptation to people who may not necessarily have watched it before. Um, I don't know, like, there, there are twists and turns here that are better experienced firsthand, I Definitely. think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, adaptation, uh, one of Charlie Kaufman's best, in my opinion, but, I mean, I'm a bit biased. I, I kind of love all his films to varying mm-hmm. degrees. Um, so, yeah, definitely check this out. This is one. This is our main topic for the theme for a reason. I think it, <laughs> most, uh, it most perfectly encapsulates it, you know. Um, and similarly, from the screenwriting perspective to the acting perspective, uh, let's talk about Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, uh, more simply known as Birdman. It is a 2014 American black comedy drama directed by Alejandro Inaratu, uh, who I think most people would know for <laughs> The Revenant, you know. Um, the, the, the bear mauling scene is probably his most iconic moment in cinema. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, I think actually, that aside, I actually feel like Birdman is this... Is his best uh, film. Yes, I agree. Um, and, and the film covers, uh, man, um, this, this, <laughs> this is so trippy because because Michael Keaton, right? You know, is sort of playing himself in a way that Charlie Kaufman is almost, uh, you know, um, uh, portraying himself by via Nicolas Cage. You know? Yeah. Um, it's it's so wild. I don't really know how to describe, but man, uh, like, uh, okay, you. Why don't you give a plot synopsis? My my head was just like spinning trying to spin <laughs> Okay, so basically, oh man, there's no way to really describe it directly. But if we were to draw it to real day Michael Keaton, mm-hmm. I think that would help a lot, right? Okay, yeah. I, I think that that's probably the best way to go about it. So Michael Keaton at that time in the this was early 2010s, right? Yes, that's right. So it follows, I guess, what you would say, a washed-up superhero actor. Yes. Uh, Michael Keaton, former Batman. Yes. Um, right. who, a- who attempts to regain legitimacy uh, and revive his fading career by writing, directing, and starring in an incredibly self-indulgent Broadway <laughs> production. Yeah. So that, that, that's essentially what Birdman is. Uh, main character of Birdman played by Michael Keaton is essentially Michael Keaton mm-hmm. who played Batman, you know, back in Tim Burton's one, uh, films in the early 90s and his career has stalled, you know, yeah. up, up to the point of Birdman which sort of re- rejuvenated his career to an extent. Yeah, and then he went on to play an actual Birdman. Uh, in A Vulture in <laughs> Spider-Man, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, of course, Inaritu being like in, insanely famous or infamous for the matter of only wanting to use natural light. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the insane kind of like camera work that goes into Birdman just kind of adds to this whole like uh, very realistic uh, but at the same time incredibly like impressive long takes of like hallways and, and, and journeys down the street and all of that right yeah um, uh, it's a bit like 1917 in the way one of the gimmicks of Birdman hmm. Which which won the Academy Award for cinematography, by the way, is the is the is the is the long take approach to what is essentially three or four scenes. The this this two hour film essentially feels like three or four long scenes, Yeah. Uh, but they're, they're not true long takes. There are hidden cuts in it, but it feels like you know, uh, mm-hmm. like a long take, la. Uh, but still, you know, given the the number of sets, the number of actors, the staging, the blocking, the rehearsal time involved in this extraordinary and and also the <laughs> fact that because you know Inaratu refuses to use like lighting techniques he uses natural light makes yep. it all the more difficult you know um and i can only imagine the pain that they went through in in uh filming this and and the production process you know and and the blocking and everything you know it's it's insane um as is the script itself you know which is yep. which is really great it's such a a sty- stylishly crafted and 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 darkly comedic portrait of of the ego uh michael keaton's character's ego you know so in the film michael michael keaton plays um 
what's his character name? Regan, Regan Thompson, right? Yeah. You know? Like this actor at the TON office, uh, relevancy, you know. So um, he decides to construct this this Broadway production, which goes awry in in its its uh in its uh initial run, you know. Um, and it is full of meta commentary on on actors. Critics and the relationship between art and vanity, mm-hmm. uh, and, and about how this once superhero actor is mount, mounting an artsy comeback that certainly feels very self-reflective of that vanity, you know. Yeah. But but how, however, I urge I think viewers to not read too deeply into the self-referential nature because I think it's mostly implemented to draw harder laughs out of the punchline because <laughs> it's of Michael Keaton um, uh, making fun of himself. Yeah. Um, the, it's it's it's. And say because like you know like uh, for example Edward Norton right you know yeah uh, he is infamously uh, and infamously difficult to work with you know uh, and and he stars in this is in this film as a contentious actor Mike Shiner uh, who basically plays uh, a, a, a loosely fictionalized version <laughs> of himself you know um, yeah. so so the characters are devices through which the director and co-writer uh, in uh, he that, that's how he applies Birdman's pointed satirical observations, the mm-hmm. characterizations are heightened to, to almost allegorical levels to let Inaratu's characters serve as symbols for the issues that filmmakers and actors encounter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this, this is great. You know? And, and Regan Thompson, Michael Keaton, is a man who confuses admiration with love. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that's the, one, of, one of the main themes of the film. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, just like the little kind of ways that you know, um, it 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 kind of like dips us into this whole feeling like uh, it dips us into the realm of magical realism, right? Like the moments in time where you know he he visualizes himself uh, with with his superpowers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, back with his superpowers, or like the fantastical moments that kind of happen, or like uh, even something that I didn't really notice on the first time around that I watched just in cinemas, uh, but I did feel it was something strange. There's this particular scene with Emma Stone. Yeah. Um where there's something very odd with her eyes, right? Like mm-hmm. they're in the they're in the green room uh and they're talking and like her eyes I mean Emma Stone has huge eyes, don't get me wrong, but like mm-hmm. there's her eyes seem to grow bigger over the course of that particular scene. Mm. Um and that was yes. something that that unnerved me a great deal. Yep. Uh, but I didn't realize that it was actually intentional until like watching it uh, uh, again later on, and then like finding out that they did they did do something to her eyes, um, mm-hmm. just to kind of like you know have that whole strange kind of unnerve, um, just to unnerve the audience, you know, or to make a particular point. I think they were talking about like how you um how he was v- being viewed by the media or something like that at that point in time, um. But yeah, like all these kind of little, little things uh, are so well weaved together, you know. And it even came to the point for me, like when we, uh, the scenes in which Birdman speaks to Regan, right? Like yes. his internal voice is Regan, reminded me of an actual Batman mm. uh, episode. No, it was a Batman of the Future episode where mm. old, uh, old Bruce Wayne um, basically gets captured and someone is trying to mind control him, but they addressed him as Bruce in his head and that's how he knew that it wasn't him. Because right. in his head, he calls himself Batman. Batman, yeah. 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 Uh, you Bruce know. Wayne is the disguise. Yeah. 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 So, it, that I mean, that was just kind of one of those things. I don't know. It was like something they were trying to directly reference, but it, it got a chuckle out of me for sure. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, Emma Stone earlier. To go back to her, I think she has uh, she was given a lot more to do here than at that time she was starring in the Amazing Spider Man, right? Yep, that's right. Uh, and the, the two films, and I was so disappointed with how she was used there. So uh, this gave this gave me hope, like, and it reminded me that Emma Stone is such a great actress. She you is, know? yes. There's a, there's a raw honesty to her portrayal as, as Regan's um, daughter slash assistant Sam. Yeah, that serves to create a, a distinct contrast between her and her. Um, image conscious father mm-hmm. um, I guess you know like you know part of the reason um, things start falling apart in the film because he, he is content he is contending with this with a volatile daughter like, who is who is uh, freshly out of rehab right you yeah know? And, and I think Regan always even even in the film uh, and, and in the production of his play keeps his focus on presenting himself in a way that would elicit the most acclaim you know like like for example there's a scene when an actor who's not up to snuff 
is knocked out by a stage light, you know, that, that falls <laughs> on the rafters, you know. Uh, you know, for which Rigan is convinced he's responsible. Like his injury gives Rigan the opportunity to replace him with a, a Broadway actor who can help sell more tickets, right? You know, yeah. it's a it's a piece of malignant narcissism that helps. Um, illustrate the mindset of of the protagonist, his lack of sensitivity to those around him, and a predominant concern from himself. La. And Michael Keaton's performance is remarkable. It, it careens from comedic set piece through dramatic climax at several points of the film. Yeah. And and he does the unca- he has the uncanny ability to humanize the character, uh, the character's de- desperate need to feel important. Mm-hmm. And allows the self-obsessed actor to feel empathetic. It's almost, uh, it's almost Bojack Horseman esque. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I did we watch this together? I think we did, right? Uh, when you it might have. Uh, I, I, I can't quite. Re- I watched this multiple times in cinema, so I might have watched it with many groups actually. Mm, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I remember. Okay. So the reason I kind of bring that up is that I can't remember if I was having this conversation with you or with some of our friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and someone expressed the opinion that the film should have ended at the end of the play. Yes. Right? Uh, as opposed to having the extended scene after that. Yep. Um, th- what are your thoughts on that? Right? Because like apparently it's not something that, you know, it's not an uncommon um, opinion. Mm. Uh, I, I could see, bo- I could have it both ways. La. Yeah. Like if you, if you want the film to end after the play, Sure, that happens in your head, lah. You know, yeah. and and what, ha- what what everything that happens afterwards, think of it as a DVD extra. Mm, okay, you know. Okay. But yeah, but I I enjoy both versions of it. I think yep. they both work. Yeah, I think I at the point in time, the first time I watched it, at least I could have been convinced that you know, like the 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 play end should have been the true end. Mm-hmm. Um, but on on subsequent viewings, like then I I feel like that kind of misses the point, right? Like yep. that doesn't give us that gives us only half the story mm. uh, and it doesn't resolve the other half of the story at all you know yep, um, yep. so so I mean I've grown to come to expect uh, accept the film in its totality uh, that mm-hmm. way um, and it was just kind of fascinating uh, because you kind of have a false end right You're like uh, built into the, the script itself yeah yeah it's um, it's also kind of a love letter to New York um New York stage, uh, the stage scene, you know, if you've yeah. ever been to uh, Midtown or, or, or Broadway and, and walked in those particular areas, it, it's so uh, accurate in mm. its depiction of it. Um, <laughs> and I, I think a part of it also has to do with the mind-boggling complexity of the single take shots. Like, it it kind of takes a cue from um, an Alfred Hitchcock movie called Rope. Uh, whereby the meticulously blocked um, shoot kind of cleverly finds ways to mask cuts, you know, using invisible visual effects to stitch together various scenes so it appears like the entire film is one continuous take. Now, mm-hmm. 1917 is the most, uh, is the latest incarnation of that, you know. Uh, and, and the camera work is so alert and virtuoso in its own right, you know. Yep. Uh, and plus, I feel like the single shot illusion kind of serves to address this critique that screen acting is somehow less demanding than stage acting mm-hmm. since, you know, there are no conventional editing tricks uh, in place to shape the performances, you know. So that the cast has no choice but to empty up, which, which everyone does in spades. And, and the film is built generously enough that everyone gets ample time to impress, uh, you know, not just Michael Keaton, you know. Um, although it should be noted that uh, some of the, I guess some of the background sexual intrigue kind of kind of amounts to nothing. Uh, plot yeah. Wise in, in the end, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but but in in the end, like just the the striking elements of the visual style, you know, is so beautiful. The way the camera swirls from scenes uh, as you move from one part of the theater to the other, from one day into the next, you know, the the camera whipping from one focus to another accentuates the anxious energy of, of Birdman, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is, you know, the uh, Antonio Sanchez's frenzy dr- uh, jazz drum score, you know, the yeah. clashes, like, clanks in the background. It creates a sense of chaos against Riggan Thompson uh, that, that makes the film very visceral, like you are walking in his shoes, uh, you know. Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. Is, these are the kinds of um, ingenious walk and talks that I guess could, could maybe elevate like someone like Aaron Sorkin, who is uh, <laughs> very, very static with his walk and talks. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah, just the touch on the music a bit, right? Like the yeah. solo jazz percussion by, by Sanchez is brilliant. It mm. is so, so brilliant. Like outside of a number of classical pieces, 
yeah. um, which apparently, uh, you know, are, are all coming from from uh, within within the scene itself. Like yeah. everything else is just like straight up jazz percussion, and l- w- watching it for the first time was kind of mind blowing. Um, mm-hmm. To real kind of realize like what uh, fifteen thirty minutes into the movie, like that's all we're gonna be getting. <laughs> it was kind of mind blowing just how evocative uh, the percussion alone could be for so many of the scenes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and one of the most uh, enjoyable parts of it. But the thing is, is that I did, I did go and like try and listen to the to the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside of that, and it doesn't quite work as something that you can listen to on your own. You know, um, mm. uh, which which I found interesting, given that there are so many films whose soundtracks that I love that can be enjoyed outside of the film itself. But mm-hmm. for this particular one. Like Sanchez's work is tied so intricately with the movie itself that it's hard to divorce it. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I think nearly every part of the movie, from the music to the cinematography to the acting to the writing, uh, works in concert. Uh, and it works so flawlessly in a way that you know, um, uh, Riggins uh, play doesn't. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic film. I highly recommend it. You watch it. <laughs> highly, highly recommend. But yeah. at this point, you know, with all the acclaim and everything, I don't know if it... actually you know what weirdly enough a lot of my friends haven't seen Birdman really I mean like, I feel like there were a couple of waves like the initial wave and then people were really hype about it and then for some yeah. reason it got an extended play is yeah. what I remember and then a lot of other people went to, to watch that Um, but I mean I understand how something like Birdman could fly under the radar for a lot of people it wasn't mm-hmm. particularly marketed um very well right like you had to be I wouldn't say in the know, you know, but you kind of had to have your your finger on the 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 pulse, right, of like slightly askew cinema. Yeah, a, a cinephile uh, that goes yeah. to projector and stuff like that, <laughs> like. which admittedly makes up a lot of my friend base. But I'm guessing like more casual people probably would have missed Birdman when it came to cinemas. Yeah. Uh, if if you were one of them, I highly recommend that you 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 watch Birdman. Um, yes. It's it's available on VOD everywhere. You can buy it on Amazon. I have the DVD. Um, I also have the DVD adaptation. Um, which I bought on Amazon. <laughs> Man. Uh. One of the one of the best films, or uh, I think the best film of uh, in Ratu's career. Um, I I don't know whether you agree or not. No, definitely. I mean, like Revenant for all its technical magnitude, right? Mm. Like pales in comparison. I think as a work, right? Like in terms of the story that he was trying to tell, in terms of, uh, what his vision tried to accomplish. I think Birdman is is several orders of magnitude more mm-hmm. successful. Yeah. Um. You know, and that like, sure, it was hard and it was difficult to to pull off, right? And there's so many technical aspects to that, but uh, at the same time, it didn't take like several extra years and like crew people suffering in Siberia <laughs> to get it done. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Indeed, man. Yeah. Uh, go check out Adaptation and Birdman. Those are two of the more well-known films that we'll be talking about this yep. week. Uh, the next couple a little less well-known. Um, you know, one is an indie anime and one is just a straight up like indie art house thing which didn't show anywhere except for um my uh, one of my friend who runs Anticipate Pictures brought the film in Madeline's Madeline, but it didn't show anywhere else. Like it wasn't in projector, it wasn't in um uh, G V or Shaw or anything yeah. like that, you know. Um so it's an art house film called Madeline's Madeline. And I don't blame Isa for not catching this because it wasn't a widely known film. Yeah. Uh, but this introduced me to Josephine Decker, who has since become uh, one of my favorite filmmakers. She recently directed a film called Shirley last year, starring Elizabeth Moss, about uh, the the life and times of author Shirley Jackson, uh, who most famously wrote the the Haunting of Hill House. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So this is Madeline's Madeline. So this is experimental cinema, like Ooh, uh, yeah, yeah. The other two films are experimental to an extent, yeah. but this is really experimental cinema. And I have seen a lot of experimental cinema. I've been very open to it. So I don't have to say at its worst, right? Experimental cinema can come across <laughs> as as pretentious or confounding. Yeah. You know, even as audiences appreciate the ambition behind the effort. Mm-hmm. At its best, though, the experience can be immersive, intoxicating, and even you know transcendent. And I think Josephine Decker's uh, Madeline's Madeline clearly falls into the latter category. I, Madeline's Madeline wasn't just the most invigoratingly original film I saw in 2018. In fact, I think it was my number one film of 2018, uh, if 
yep, it was. I mm-hmm. just went to look at my pop wireless. You know, it, <laughs> it is one of those rare movies that kind of willingly upends the medium's established narrative cadence yeah. to, to shape shift into its own unconventional yet yet thoroughly compelling form, you know. But as impressively creative at, uh, as it's, uh, you know, he has this very like percussive dislocation and fragmented or fractured imagery, yeah. you know. None of it could have flourished, right, without the performance of its central star, Helena oh, Howard, yeah. who at that who at that point was a total unknown, and and this was a star making debut. Um, it's an unnerving yet mesmerizing kind of identity blurring turn that that anchors the film's, I guess, um, metaphor abstractions and and roots it in visceral emotion. Yeah. So she plays the titular Madeline. She is a precocious but psychologically troubled teenage actress whose undefined mental illness is exacerbated by her emotionally exploitative theatre director, uh, Evangeline, who is played by Molly Parker. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in, in any role, Madeline, right? In any role, sometimes human, sometimes animal. She, sometimes she plays animals. Um, Madeline's aptitude for acting is obvious. You know, she combines observational acuity with an absolute commitment to draw upon an unstable world of anxiety and insecurity inside her mm-hmm. to in order to transform and in order to transfer her, her feelings uh, into the role, you know. And, and her theatre troupe myopically only sees raw talent, but, but it's her overwhelmed yet attentive single mother, Regina, played by Miranda July, um, that feels the brunt of her increasing erraticism at home. Yeah. You know, she, she's a supportive mother. Regina is, is supportive, but she grows worried about the toll that these acting classes are exacting on Madeline's already kind of fractured, roiling psyche, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so, like, to make it even worse, like, Madeline is currently struggling with an unorthodox, immersive theatre project, you know? Yeah. So, so Evangeline looks to Madeline as an inspiration and a centerpiece, fully aware that her young actress's kind of tenuous relationship with her mother, uh, she's aware, like, you know, their, their relationship is not good. It's mm-hmm. fracturing. So eventually contrives to, to insert Regina into rehearsal with the intention of provoking louder, more quote-unquote authentic reactions on Madeline, yep. you know? So, so by inviting Regina into Madeline's only avenue of mental escape, the director is willfully causing distress in order to craft an entire meta-production around Madeline's um, familial scars and her creative process under the guise of collaborative art, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and this is interesting because there are a lot of directors who do this, maybe not to this extent, but yeah. they do ask you to dig deep and they do provoke you in ways that scar you psychologically in real life to evoke a more quote-unquote authentic performance, right? You know? yeah. and, and this speaks to, you know, we already talked about the rewards with... with uh, Adaptation, we talked a bit about the perils with Birdman. This is the ultimate peril of losing yourself in art by blurring uh, our theme for this episode, by blurring your real life and imagination, you know. Um, what, what were your thoughts on Madeline's Madeline now that you've uh, recently seen it? Ooh, um, it is such a exasperating and in many ways perversely um, unnerving film. Yeah, yeah. I, I think just the way in which everything is kind of like composed, especially to me, the camera work and the way that, that everything is kind of shot, um, layered with the fact that this is essentially a psychological tussle between three um, women who have, you know, like very different kind of like issues um, of, of insecurity, of... of um, uh, of misplaced affection. Um, but it really is... There are moments in time where you are completely caught by how brilliant the performances are. Mm. And there are moments in times when you feel absolutely sickened by mm. the situation in which these performances takes place. Yep. Uh, and it is difficult to stomach. Uh, so it, it's... On, on the one hand, you can immediately see just because it is so good, mm-hmm. um how uh, Decker especially like shines through so many layers of acting, right? Like acting as an actor who's acting um, mm-hmm. and all of that, right? But her character and the situation that she's going through and going in and just like this kind of hazy, I wouldn't really say fever dream. Like it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily feel like that. Like it's still fairly grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, but this kind of hazy, almost... Um, out-of-body experience, right? 
of yeah. of her struggling to understand what is going on around her and mm-hmm. using acting as just kind of like a, an outlet for that, right? Like that's kind of the only time in which, you know, um, well, the camera doesn't do kind of like the soft focus thing. Like that's the only time where she is really kind of present in that. Um, problem is that when she is present in that, she's also at the same time kind of like running away from from all these other things, you know, um, mm-hmm. that are happening in her life. Um, the close-up shots are incredibly unnerving. Mm. I think especially of conversations between um, uh, Evangeline and Madeline. Yeah. Like, it's it's very hard to look away. It's very, very hard to not notice this little kind of like um, side glances, you know, the little breaths, the little, the little kind of like um, as, uh, aspirations of, of breath, right? That like just yeah. make it extremely voyeuristic on a level that um, it's skin crawling. It can be skin crawling, right? Um, a it lot is. of the time it does feel, you know, predatory on Evangeline's part, which I think gets increasingly obvious as the film goes along. But mm. even as an audience, I felt that as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I, that that was... It It almost feels like it is a director uh, highlighting this to kind of pay penance for appropriating the, the traumas of... Yeah, uh, for actors, you know what I mean. Um, and and because Evangeline, Evangeline, as you said, kind of obliterates the boundary between personal and professional space, you know. Yeah. Um, it, with her improvisational her improvisational role play and all of that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the film does an exceptional job and 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 plunging the audience into the girl's struggle for clarity, as you said. With, yes. With luminous shifts in camera focus, the the carefully displaced sound design. The, the dreamlike sequences sequences that question if something was fantasy, memory, or reality. Yeah. You know, the, the, the lines between reality and imagination further dissolve if you consider that I think uh, I've read up uh, that Decker's film itself was developed out of similar improvisations mm. with Howard and other collaborators. Yep. You know? So much like how its themes examine if such a process constructs fiction or if fiction is constructing you, uh, the film deconstructs its own real life production without ever leaving you disengaged from the striking work on screen. Uh, uh-huh. You know, um, I think Madeline's Madeline might not be for everyone, but I think like this is the kind of radical filmmaking yeah. that really reinvigorates a person like me who watches like you know fifty films a week, <laughs> um, and then you get kind of like even like okay films like seven out of tens. You know tend to make me angry because yeah. I feel like I've wasted two hours of my life when I could have been watching an eight or nine on, you know. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> if, if I see something this different, it's, it's one of those that really refreshes me. Mm-hmm. Like, um, at, at, right at this moment, I'm in the midst of like uh, this binge for, for South by Southwest 2021. I'm going to be watching like over 50 films over the next seven days. So, it, it, and I've done this several times for major film festivals. Yeah. You know, like Singapore Film Fest, which is even harder because I have to run from theater to theater and stuff like that, you know? So, like, I mean, like, a couple of years ago, for example, I had watched, like, 37 films at that time already. I was feeling exhausted with SGIFF. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I went in uh, feeling broken. I went in to watch um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire and it mm. totally, like, made everything feel worth it, you know? Like, if yeah. I could spend 38 hours and I found this gem, it's worth it, you know? And, and similarly, with Madeline's Madeline, it, it, it had the same impact for me. Like, like radical filmmaking... Yeah. Uh, and very unique, always catches my attention, regardless of whether it works for every single demographic of the audience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I, I, you, you are right. I, I do feel like thematically and just like the, I think maybe even like ex- experientially, right? Um, in in terms of both the visuals and, and the way that things are edited and and put together with the performances, um, I do feel that this. M- it might be triggering for some people, right? Yeah. Like, just the way in which, um, it, it, like, Madeline's few states are something that I, I have had described to me before by friends mm. who, who have been undergoing, like, and, like great moments of stress of with anxiety and, and, and depressive states, um, mm-hmm. you know. So, I'm curious. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, I do feel like it might hit a bit close to home for some people. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it does feel very visceral, right? Like as mm-hmm. dreamy and as 
uh, as as soft as some of the shots and the way they are composed are. Like again, you know, it is incredibly unnerving because I think that for people who identify with, are uh, not identify for people who have suffered through some sort of mental illness, right? There are moments in time within the film itself that you can mm-hmm. identify with, uh, and that may or may not, you know, have a effect on you that is, um, that. Is triggering, triggering. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like with mental illness, or I mean, in more in a more broader sense, if you've ever dealt with dominating authority figures, yeah, who've who've used you without your consent, you know, it's, uh, it's it is triggering, like it's triggering, like it's it's intricate psycholo- It's an intricate psychological dance, but also psychological uh, exploitation. Yes. Uh, and and, and a vicious uh tri tri uh tug of war. For Madeline's uh mental mental health, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, fantastic film, definitely recommend it. Uh, personally, one of my favorites of the twenty tens. Uh, next up, we're gonna jump back to the nineteen nineties. Uh, <laughs> to to delve into the work of Satoshi Khan, who is, again, when I say radical, one of the <laughs> oh most radical anime directors, anime auteurs, yeah, uh, that has ever come out of Japan, and also, funnily enough, Satoshi Khan. Uh, the most ripped off filmmaker of all time. Um, he's most he's best known for Paprika, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of people haven't seen Paprika, but if you've seen Inception, and I'm guessing you have, you've seen <laughs> Paprika because Christopher Nolan fucking ripped that off from Paprika. Yeah, pretty if much. you have not seen Perfect Blue, I guarantee you, you've seen Black Swan. Darren Aronofsky lifted the entire film from Perfect Blue. Mm. So if you want me to describe what Perfect Blue is, it is Black Swan, essentially. Essentially. You know? Essentially. Yeah. I mean, the setting is slightly different. Yeah. Um, but uh, like plot, themat- beat for plot beat. Wise, yeah, yeah, thematically and everything, yeah. One of the most ripped off filmmakers of all time. I feel so bad. If you like Inception, if you like Black Swan, and I'm, I'm not saying those are bad movies. I'm saying they're really good movies. Yep. I'm just pointing out there. Absolutely incontrovertible fact that they ripped off Satoshi Khan's films. It came to the point where Aronofsky bought the rights for Perfect Blue just so that you know he, <laughs> he, he wouldn't would be, be accused yeah. of plagiarizing. Like it's it's essentially an adapt- adaptation, to be honest. Just instead of uh, a pop idol and 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 acting, replace it with uh, ballet. Mm-hmm. You got Black Swan, you know. Um, so okay. The film, it follows a character named Mima uh, Kirigoi, uh, who is a member of a Japanese idol group. Uh, who then retires from music to pursue an acting career. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, she becomes a victim of stalking uh, and gruesome murders begin to occur and Mima starts to lose her grip on reality. Um, and like much of Khan's later work, like, like Paprika, the film deals with the blurring of lines between fantasy and reality in contemporary Japan. Yeah. You know? um, and and it, it, a lot of the themes kind of predict the internet age to an extent. Yeah. You know? I think, like, Perfect Blue announces its preoccupation with perception and identity and voyeurism by the internet in particular mm-hmm. uh, and, and, perform- and performance, you know, especially in relation to, I think, females, you know, right from the opening sequence, you know, the perception of reality cannot actually be trusted. Yeah. Uh, and, and the visual setup uh, is, is especially as a... It's, it's set up as a psychodrama uh, and it heightens towards the climax and to the point where you don't know what's real and not mm-hmm. you know, or, or what's not, you know. Uh, I think the themes relate to pop idols and, and acting idols in, in any culture uh, and how their performances impact the, the male gaze uh, and the issue of their roles. Uh, I think Mima's madness results from her own subjectivity and attacks on her identity from people on the internet. And keep in mind, when this film came out, yeah. the internet wasn't really a thing yet. Mm-hmm. It was in 1997. Seven. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the internet was around, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it, 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 it isn't what it is today. Yeah. Satoshi Kon essentially predicted the internet's impact on female performance uh, with Perfect Blue, you know. Um, well, well, what's your opinion on Perfect Blue? It's been a while since you've seen it, you know. Yeah. But, like, well, what, what do you remember of it? Um, well, I, I think the last time I caught Perfect Blue was about five years ago. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and... Um, Okay, just to just to kind of like harp on uh, not to, to what you kind of mentioned, right? The whole idea, like, sure, in in nineteen ninety seven, you know, internet. You okay? It wasn't so much that the internet didn't exist in nineteen ninety seven. Is that social yeah. media didn't exist in nineteen ninety seven, right? Mm. Like the or, or it didn't exist in the way that it is now, right? Uh, this whole idea of like, um, 
you, what what your identity is uh, for it to have been captured by Con in Perfect Blue, right? Uh, on a very like um f- for for Mina, uh, for Mima, right? Like it's dual or maybe triple, right? There are a, a set kind of number of identities that exist within uh her life rather um that she has to kind of contest with, right? Then and then of course like that's what the audience sees of her and all of that. And then come to this day and age, right, where that the possibility of that is magnified like several times over, right? Mm-hmm. Like with every different social media platform, you are portraying a different side of yourself, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's to your friends and to your family, or you know, to, to, to an audience, to your clients, to your customers, whatever that may be, right? When you're someone in the spotlight and on the internet in this day and age, right, there are facets of yourself that have to be portrayed and exaggerated in order for you to survive. Um, that's simply it. For that to have been captured so succinctly mm-hmm. um, in, by Satoshi back in 1997 is really quite mind-blowing, right? Mm-hmm. And in that sense, I also feel that thread and how strong that is in Perfect Blue uh, makes this more successful as a story about the perils of fame and mm. being in the public eye than Black Swan was. I agree. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, in the end, you know, how many like crazy fanboys of like ballet dancers are there? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of one way, way to do that. I think it's interesting that, you know, Aronofsky de- decided to go that route, right? Like yeah. it wasn't, obviously, you know, you want to, you buy the rights already, you want to kind of like move away so you don't get accused of whatever. Yeah. Sure, yeah. right? But for it to be specifically ballet, right? As opposed to the world of, of J- J-pop, which is like leagues mm. apart um, in, in terms of like the fan base that it gets or in, in, you know, the kind of crazy that it attracts. Um, or actresses, you know? Or actresses, yeah, for that matter, yeah. right? Yeah. Like being in the public eye and confusing, um, you know, the identities of your performative identities with your personal identities, and yeah. and all of that is something that I think in this day and age is very, very common even for people who aren't in those industries, mm. right? Uh, and, and maybe for anyone who puts themselves out there, regardless of the, the extent to it, right? You, ha- you are suffering from, from something similar to what Mima has suffered. Yeah, yeah, okay. So either Perfect Blue was way ahead of its time or it already noticed specific things about what the media and the internet do to people's treatment of women yep. and perceptions of themselves long before the subject became kind of part of mainstream discourse. Mm-hmm. And the, the answer to that is it's both. Yeah. He was prescient in this. You know? um, and, and I think Khan recognized the disturbing possibilities with the internet at a time when I think most of us, myself included, were preoccupied with the utopian egalitarian future it was supposedly supposed to bring us, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's, it's, it's come to a point where that's no longer true. The, the media has this dangerous capability to obscure the truth uh, and it's finally being exposed, you know, not, not to uh, mention the, the rampant institutional misogyny and, and sexual abuse across mm-hmm. so many industries, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and Perfect Blue feels not one bit outdated, you know. Uh, besides, of course, the, the hardware, like, the blocky and unwieldy computers. You know? But other than that, you know, thematically, it's, <laughs> it's correct, you know. Yeah. This is a film about, a young, about a, one young woman driven to the brink of insanity by the stresses of the entertainment industry mm-hmm. uh, and, and demanding performative emotional flaying from her by, by you know, the gaslighting of another woman who believes yep. herself to be the true owner of the protagonist's identity, identity to, the, to the predatory advances of a cyber stalker mm-hmm. in a time before that word was even invented. You know? yep. um, the internet was kind of imagined to, be, to, to grant a level, a level playing field upon which communication could be had with yeah. more freedom than ever before. And I think Khan was amongst the ranks of people like William Gibson and Neil Stephenson who foresaw instead how it granted an unprecedented realm of performance. Mm. One which could truly allow for an individual to create a persona that is divorced from their public and personal selves in any number of ways. Yeah. You know, and of course, the next logical question that arises out of whether the public or online self is the true one, you know, who, what is, which is the real one or are they 
all like fragments of your real self, you know. Yeah. These are these are questions that Perfect Blue asks in 1997. You know, the relationship between one's identity and one's performance themselves is at the core of I think most of Khan's works. Uh, a bit like uh, how Kahneman is, you know, mm-hmm. um, engaged with writing. Yeah. And he explored this not just in our relationship with the internet but also with entertainment, with our work, with our dreams. Uh, and in different combinations, these interrelated identities, he found terror and drama and, and, and beauty too, of course, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, with, in the ways that they clash or fuse. Um, the self-relationship relationship with self is a source of terror and uncertainty in Perfect Blue um, because it reflects and evaluates, um, you know, the actress uh, and... and, and your per, uh, your dissociative identities that come with that, you know, of, yeah. of you know, of, of performative, uh, the how much you perform like, for people, you know, it's it's fantastic, and and the way it unwinds, and the way it feels dreamy, and uh, the way I I don't say shot animated, the way it's animated, yeah, uh, very different from most animes. It's very it's very con style, yeah, but it's very different. It's very different from say an Akira or goes in the show. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like perfect blue and the way that. Uh, even for con work, uh, works from con, right? Perfect Blue is vastly yeah. different from Paprika in terms of like the way that it's animated, the tone of it as well. Even the artwork is slightly different. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, being the, the older film, right, uh, as well. But I think there is something to be said about the medium itself, right? Because it is animation. Um, yeah. The way in which reality blurs, uh, especially I think during her moments of psychosis, uh, yeah. feels vastly different from anything that you can possibly experience through live action cinema, right? Like the camera, it's yeah. not about the camera work here. Like things literally bleed into each other and it's something that you can kind of sense, right? Uh, and I, I wonder if it's also because that it is animation that sometimes our um, our suspension of, of uh, disbelief is different, right? Just mm-hmm. because like the medium in which we're watching it is less... Um, based on realism, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and that that's kind of an, an interesting thing to kind of think about as we are talking about the only animated work um, amongst the things they were doing. Because of of course, animation it's possible to do things in animation that you can't do in live action necessarily. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, you know, it, it it does allow you to invest deeper into a world that is simultaneously removed and yeah. very. Uh, uh, realistic too. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. um, it, 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 there's this barrier that I think allows you to process it in a way that doesn't traumatize you as much. Like, let's yeah. say, um, not as uh, exasperating as the Madeline's Madeline is. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think it's it's this horrific potency that lends Perfect Blue its its uh, cult classic timeless nature. Yep. Um, and its uh, prescient nature. Uh, it's it's so good. Uh, with with discussing the internet, you know, and I think social media has much like me mania, right? Me mania is uh, <laughs> is, the, is is the stalker, like that uh, Mima stalker that that girl that like chats up online yeah. and pretends to be her. You know, I feel like social media has only aggravated fans our us you know fans sense of ownership over artists mm-hmm. uh and, and and like how the how the range we act when when this feeling is challenged when when we, we finally realize that we don't own this person you know what i mean yeah uh, a lot of people have uh, have reacted badly to that online you know yeah. um, and then like it, make, it makes it worse like mima is now a new actress which upsets the j-pop fan base plus you know, she is uh, facing stress because, you know, she's playing a rape victim in a TV drama. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the growing numbers of murders around her, uh, you know, uh, start to cause Mima to wonder herself what's real and what's not because the mur- murders mimic what's on TV and mm-hmm. the role that she's playing, you know. So, uh, Khan demonstrates a mastery of dream logic that will become his hallmark, you know. It's very Lynchian yeah. in a way. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. It's such an underrated dimension of, of Khan's uh, work, you know, um, and yeah, for all it's you know, there's a lot of over the top violence. I'm I'm not gonna say it's it's not for it's not for kids at all. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's no. a very sophi- it's a very sophisticated film about the ways you know um a, a celebrity public persona can consume the real person within. The film mm-hmm. is twenty years old. You yeah. know, there are references to Netscape, uh, which <laughs> I noticed recently, uh, and, and and facts, you know. Uh, yeah. But it feels more relevant in the age of social media and Me Too. Mm-hmm. Then it was in 1997, and few films can age this way, and and Perfect Blue is one of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. To be able to kind of capture the essence of these parasympathetic relationships, right? 
um, mm. so so many years before you know the 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 peak of social media and like streamers and 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 internet celebrities um that we have today is really kind of mind blowing um mm-hmm. yeah and i think i think like it's an interesting it's an interesting look into the psychology of that 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 um con has been able to to capture you know so if you're curious about any of that right um mm-hmm. then highly recommend watching perfect blue again it, this is considered by many to be kind of a cult classic uh in the anime as far as anime movies go um definitely and you can definitely check out all con's uh, other work but i don't think any of them are as visceral or evocative as perfect blue definitely yeah i do feel like satoshi con with his tendency to deal with real world issues there is a certain reluctance from I think a lot of the anime fan base to embrace him. Mm-hmm. You know, there are no like uh, there's no cyberpunk or <laughs> max fighting. You know, yeah, this is more. In fact, like a film like this might even uh, touch enough with a lot of anime fan base people. Yeah, you know, and 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 how they treat uh, the celebrities that they interact with online. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but in in that way, that, that's what makes it important. You know, so highly recommend all four of these films: adaptation by Charlie Kaufman, Inaratu's Birdman. Uh, Satoshi Kon's so Effect Blue, of course, and Josephine Dacker's Madeline, Ma- Madeline's Madeline, which one of my favorite films of 2018. Uh, if not for Paddington 2, uh, <laughs> which I will get around to talking about. Uh, Paddington yeah, is my yeah, for sure. Of, of the 2010s. But anyways, yeah. Uh, these four are highly recommended. Uh, maybe not for everyone. I do have to say, more than any of the other topics yeah. that we've talked about from previous episodes, I think these four films are really not for everyone. You have to have uh, a certain curiosity about the creative process mm-hmm. to be engaged in narratives such as this. Yeah, it's not. You can't turn turn off and watch these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you can for some of them, but you know, uh, it does require a fair bit more involvement. Um, yeah. Than some of the other things that we tend to recommend that we are able to recommend. Definitely, man. Yeah. Um, and that wraps it up for this episode of Behold. Uh, all of them, all of these titles are available on DVD and VOD right now. Mm-hmm. Check your local streaming services, whether you have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. Some of them are on there. I'm pretty sure. I, but man, it's on Netflix for sure. Yeah. Because uh, I, I recently saw it. Uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks for genre equality number four zero, number 40, mm-hmm. uh, where we have three major titles to talk about. <laughs> Huge ones. Uh, congrats to all of you release the Snyder Cut people because Zack Snyder's Justice League comes out this Friday yeah. uh, it's four hours long it's been garnering uh, from what I've read of the reviews I've not personally seen it I haven't gotten an advanced copy yep. but from what I've read everybody unanimously agrees that it is leagues better than Joss Whedon's version uh, but you know yeah. not great Yeah, but it's better uh, and it does say that it earns the four hours so okay Cool. Sure. Um, we'll talk about Godzilla vs. Kong, uh, which is a bit of a brainless movie. I'm probably going to watch this while like ironing or something. But yeah. it, lo- it looks great. I will be talking about Raya and the Last Dragon, where Disney introduces uh, their first Southeast Asian princess. Mm-hmm. In the world. Uh, and for quick hits, we'll I'll quickly run through season two of Solar Opposites, which is coming out in two weeks. Uh, I'm particularly excited to talk about a couple of indie horror films. Yeah. Uh, one is Come True and one is La Laronia uh, from Guatemala. Uh, and this is, uh, remember last last month where I only had one 7 out of 10 recommendation and mm. everything up top and below? Yeah. There are three titles here that are 8 and above. Damn. Uh, so I'm very excited. Oh, although, you know, there are plenty of uh, sucky ones. Like, um, spoiler alert, Chaos Walking was not good. Um, <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but most most excited of all I'm, I'm excited to talk about is Dota Dragon's Blood, which I had no anticipation for. Yep. No anticipation for. It <laughs> jumped up to my number one show of 2021 so far. Dota Dragon's Blood. Okay, maybe not number one. Like, there's a show on HBO Max called It's a Sin, which is also very good. It's about the AIDS crisis in the 80s. Mm-hmm. But it's very close. It's very highly ranked. That it. is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've never played Dota, so. Hey, maybe someone who plays Dota might like it even more than me. But I was so into the world that I wanted to play Dota too. Um, <laughs> I saw be talking about Pacific Rim, the Black, which mm. may be not as intriguing as uh, an adaptation as Dota is. Yeah. Uh, and finally, I'll be talking about uh, 21 Years Too Late, uh, the book House of Leaves, which I recently read uh, thanks to our friend Chris. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
what what are you most looking forward to uh on on the next episode of genre? Uh, I I mean, as and when I'm I haven't caught any Dota yet, so I want to check out that. I'm most excited to talk about Raya and the Last Dragon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that for me is the main thing. I'm gonna mm. try my best to mm. not whine about Justice League. Uh, mm. after sitting through four hours of it, but we will see how that goes, right? Generally, a- again, like you know, if it makes if it makes a better film, sure, right? I- yeah. I'm gonna. I- I'm going to respect the fact that money and time was put into that and, and watch it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Godzilla and Kong, right? I mean, we, we get what we ask for. Yeah. Giant animal monsters like hitting each other. Sure, let's just mm. do that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be trying to catch some of the other things as well. Dota, when, when I get my hands on it. Uh, I'm also watching Solar Opposites as well. Um, nice. So really, really excited to talk about some of them. Um, not so excited to talk about others of them, but you know, we'll we'll spend we'll we'll do our due diligence anyway for you guys. Definitely, man. Yeah. Uh, if you want to read my personal review of Raya and the Last Dragon, you can find it at Potwire. I copy pasted it onto the Journal Equality channel as well. Yeah. Uh, I liked it a lot. Not perfect, but we'll discuss it in greater depth mm-hmm. uh, in a couple of weeks. Until then, this has been Hit Zero. I'm Isa. Goodbye, guys. Ciao.